introduce me or I'm just starting out. I'm on. Hi, everyone. Sorry about that. Um, Hi, and welcome, and thank you all for being with us this evening. My name is Alex Giannini, and I'm one of the program managers at the library. Uh, tonight, we are honored to welcome historian James Carter, who will talk about his latest book, Champions Day. But before we start the show, a couple of notes, and as always, I promise I will be super quick. Uh, first off, if you have a question for Jay, please use the ask a question feature that's directly below me. Uh, just type in your question there and we'll do our best to get to it tonight. Uh, and if you haven't already, there's a big green button below my big fat head. You can purchase a signed copy of Champions Day by clicking right there. Jay was nice enough to sign book place for us. So uh, please do get your signed copy. Uh, and finally, while we look forward to seeing everybody again in person back at the library, we do have some more great online programs coming up. Um, this Thursday, we continue our Trev's Newsmaker series where CBS Chief Justice and Homeland Security Correspondent Jeff Pegues will sit down with uh, American investor and businessman Mark Lazary. Uh, they'll talk about Lazary's perspective on how the current pandemic has changed major league sports and business. Uh, and they'll talk about Lazary's path to success, what he does to give back, and what advice he has for up and comers taking their first steps into the business world. Uh, and then July kicks off our summer reading focus on fiction. So please do check out westportlibrary.org for more details. Uh, but now on to tonight's very exciting main event. Um, James Carter is a writer and historian of modern China. He earned his PhD from Yale University under the direction of Jonathan Spence and has taught since 1999 at St. Joseph's University in Philadelphia. He's also a Staples High School graduate and his new book, Champions Day, The End of Old Shanghai is out now. So please join me in welcoming James Carter. Thanks so much for being here, Jay. Oh, it's my it's my pleasure, and uh, and thanks to everyone for coming. Um, it is a, it's bittersweet to not be able to be there in person because I would love to be back in Westport and uh, and seeing all of you in person. On the other hand, uh, I know that some folks who are here from from far away are able to take part, even though they might not have been able to uh, manage a plane ride to come hear me talk about about Shanghai. So uh, so thank you above all for for coming. What we're going to do first uh, is two things. So first of all, uh, I have a, about a two-minute uh, video clip, uh, which is of the Shanghai races. It's not from 1941. It's from 1928. Um, but it'll give you a bit of a flavor of what was going on in the races. And I'm going to read a little passage from the book over the back of that. It's about two minutes long. And then I'm going to come back and uh, and do some more things. As we were working through the um, through the tech getting in, we had a couple of glitches in the switch. So um, I thank you for your patience in advance. So let's now get this up. Okay. The last race before the champion stakes was the Jockey Cup, a tradition at the club dating back to at least the 1860s. By the 20th century, the Jockey Cup served mainly to give those in attendance a chance to catch their breath and study the racing form one last time before placing their bets for the main event. The owners running in the champions could check on their horses before they headed to the parade ring or saddling area and then to the starting gate. Trainers could use this moment to inspect their charges for signs of injury, and with non-winning jockeys piloting this race, the other riders, who had been in constant motion since before dawn, could briefly rest, assessing their mount's mood and fine-tuning their race strategy. Standing at the rail, C.S. Mao could revel in the greatest racing day of the year and maybe reflect on the journey that had brought him here. Decades earlier, he had been destitute, fired from his job at a leather factory for stealing. Homeless and sleeping under a shed at the Shanghai docks, he had met men who eventually enabled him to join Du Yuesheng's green gang, and for years now, he had been one of Shanghai's most powerful men. Nate Wang, Ying Tang, and Dayu Dun didn't own or ride horses in the club, but they could bet on them, and bets would close at post time, when the race would begin. That moment to shut out war and inflation and all the worries of daily life in 1941 Shanghai. Wang had been harassed by police, disenfranchised by his employer. Tang had been disappointed by marriage and by Broadway. Dune had seen his career's greatest achievement bombed and burned. All three had spent a decade or more in Shanghai, building bridges between foreigners and Chinese so that they could translate one another's languages, play one another's games, design one another's buildings, and learn how to be what the other wanted. With war, it had all come crashing down. Their country was all but lost. The Britain they had so admired and emulated was on the verge of extinction too. America might offer opportunity, but it seemed unable to commit itself. And of course, there were horses, diminutive ponies dressed up and trained to go as fast as they could for a mile and a quarter. Hindhead didn't know that he had a chance to be just the sixth horse since 1869 to win three champions in a row, 
Nor did Clooney House realize that he had been favored twice to return to the winner's circle, only to come up short both times. Phantom could help his owner get over heartbreak. White Knight and Magic Circle had an opportunity to return to the glory they had once known as champion. None of these animals knew the opportunities they faced, though surely they sensed the tension in the moment as saddles, riders, and the hopes of 20,000 people were heaped onto their broad shoulders and short, shaggy legs. So that's a little picture into what was going on in Shanghai. And now let's do a switch if we can. And I'm going to take you through a day at the races. Oh, and as I said, we have a little glitch. Okay, with luck, we should have yep. slideshow playing. Have we got our slide up? Oh, it's on the black screen. Oh, no. We practiced this, folks, right before, and it worked, so we'll figure this out. So right now I see the full deck. Oh, you saw the full deck there? Yeah. If okay. you maybe start it. Yeah, let's try that. Here. Yeah. Okay. And now share. <clears throat> Fingers crossed. And go. There we go. Perfect. We got it? Yep. Okay. So everybody, um, you'll have to bear with me just a bit because the way that the tech is working, I'm uh I'm not as it, it doesn't work the same way it usually does. So I apologize if it's not as polished as I would like it to be. But there's a picture of the front of the of the front of the book. There's the, the uh, crowd you just saw uh, at the races. And now I'm going to take you through a day at the races, November 12th, 1941. Um, what's important about this day to keep in mind is, especially if you're, if you're coming at this not very familiar with what's, what's going on in China, is remember that, I mean, look at November 12th, 1941. So as Americans, we often think of World War II as beginning um, just a couple weeks after this, right? December 7th, 1941, when the Japanese attack Pearl Harbor. Of course, the Japanese also attack other places in East Asia when they do that. They attack Hong Kong, uh, they attack Singapore, um, and they attack Shanghai. Now, at the center of Shanghai is, if you look on this map, um, you can see, okay, my cursor is showing it. Right there is the Shanghai Race Club, okay? So that, that oval, that green oval, which is still there in the center of Shanghai if you go today, um, that's where the racetrack is. And the other parts of Shanghai that are important to keep in mind is you have the river, the Huangpu River, and then Suzhou Creek, Suzhou Creek forms a boundary in this yellow area um, is what's called the International Settlement. The International Settlement is functioning basically as a colony. It's not technically a colony, but it's one of those places where it, it looks like a colony, it quacks like a colony, it walks like a colony, but it's not a colony. It's a colony in every way except for name. So it's dominated and controlled by mainly British and American business interests. So in in December of 1941, or November of 1941, rather, it's neutral, right? Because neither Britain nor the United States is at war with Japan. So the rest of China, and virtually all of the coastal cities are occupied by the Japanese, except for this one little piece, this one little piece of China, this one little piece of Shanghai. And at the center of it is the racetrack. And there's a little bigger map that expands out. So the, again, you can see the green oval at the center. That's the races. Um, and then you look around. That's the, the great expanse of, of Shanghai. I'm going to take you through a couple different parts. And I'm just going to take a moment to point them out while I'm here. So we're going to be going to one of the other areas of Shanghai, which is up here, a place called Zhangwan. If you look over to the right, you're going to see, I'll mention this place, it, say that looks suspicious it's like a race course. It is. That's a Chinese run race course. There are three racetracks in Shanghai altogether. I'm also going to take you out to this little green dot right here, which is called Hardoon Gardens. Um, and there's going to be some stuff going on there as well. And a little later, I'm going to take you to a movie premiere. And the movie premiere is going to be right over here, just below the racetrack. Now, without further ado, let's get ready for a day at the races. So that's the Shanghai racetrack. If you go to Shanghai today, you can still see that building. It's right there. Um, so the racetrack is gone. It's now a park. It's called People's Park and People's Square. They're put together. 
Um, but that building is still there. And in fact, um, if things had gone a different way, um, I would have been there celebrating the launch of the book at the racetrack um, at the very the first day of June. Um, we were going to do an event right there because it's now the Museum of Shanghai History. So it really couldn't be a more appropriate venue than uh, to talk about Shanghai's history than uh, at not only the museum, but the museum that it once served as the racetrack uh, itself. So at dawn on November 12th, 1941, these are three of the people who are playing principal roles. Actually, there's five people here and they're all playing principal roles. So I'm going to start in the middle with Cornell Franklin. It's going to introduce you to a few characters. Cornell Franklin is an interesting uh, figure in Shanghai. He's an American. He's from Mississippi, uh, graduated from the University of Mississippi with a law degree. Um, he then went, became a judge in Hawaii before Hawaii was a state, uh, and then moved on to Shanghai, where he became the unofficial head of the American community. The other thing that happened to him while he was in Shanghai um, is that his wife left him for William Faulkner, which is not something that happens to very many people. Um, but William Faulkner had been his wife's childhood sweetheart, and uh, she went back to Mississippi uh, and actually lived the rest of her life with him, um, Estelle Faulkner. Um, then over, uh, you see two more pictures of, of men uh, escorting horses. If you look at, I can't, uh, to Cornell Franklin's right, um, this is a man named Bob Aitkenhead. Bob Aitkenhead is a Scottish uh, steamship engineer. Uh, he's the owner of Clooney Hill and a bunch of other horses that are all named after some of his favorite places in Scotland. And then on Franklin's left is a man named Arthur Henchman. So Arthur Henchman, everyone called him Hench. He was the manager of HSBC. Um, so that's the same HSBC as you think of today. Um, so it stands for Hong Kong and Shanghai Banking Corporation. It was the largest bank in Asia. Um, even though Shanghai wasn't its headquarters, the Shanghai branch was the most important branch of and the largest branch of the bank. So these three men are there at dawn on November 12th, getting their horses ready for Champions Day. And now I'm going to take you back to the map because I, as I take you along my little ride. So now we're going to go back to the racetrack and then go north. As you go north from there, I mentioned that there were a couple of other racetracks. Well, this is one of them that they could have had a race at on November 12th, except, well, they couldn't, right? So as you see, this is a photograph. Uh, it's a postcard showing the bombed out remains of Jiangwan. So Jiangwan is one of the, uh, the Chinese-run uh, racetracks in Shanghai, but it had been occupied. Remember, I talked about those Japanese armies that were invading. So they've surrounded all of Shanghai except for the international settlement. These Shanghai, uh, sorry, the Chinese-run tracks are not in the international settlement, so you're not going to run horses there. And what's important about Jiangwan for my story today is that this is the model of what Jiangwan was going to look like. Jiangwan was going to be the center of new Shanghai. It was going to be a new Shanghai that wasn't controlled by foreigners. It was going to be a new Shanghai that wasn't colonial or semi-colonial or anything like that. It was going to be a, a showpiece of art deco and modernism and something that was going to, to wow the world with how China had become a modern city. Um, this is the mayor's office, which combines a lot of, you can see, traditional Chinese elements and also modern features. And this is the architect who designed it, a man named Dayu Dun, who I mentioned in uh, in the excerpt that I read. Um, so Dayu Dun was Chinese. He was educated in Rome and then at the University of Minnesota, uh, practiced architecture briefly in New York, and then returned to Shanghai, um, where he spent the rest of his life. Um, his his uh, career after 1941 is uh, is has a lot of lessons in it. So we'll talk about him as well. These are some pictures of what's going on in November of 1941. I mentioned in the excerpt that he'd seen his work bombed and burned. Well, that's the destruction that had happened to it in the war. And so November 12th, 1941, what's going on in that day? Well, that's a picture of, of a statue of Sun Yat-sen. So I mentioned that Shanghai was divided into this, this international settlement. The rest of the city is governed officially by Chinese. But Remember, World War II has taken over all of China except for this international settlement. So the Chinese who are in charge of those parts of Shanghai are collaborating with the Japanese. And so they're hosting on November 12th, 1941, a celebration, which is exceptionally awkward. It's a celebration of Sun Yat-sen's birthday. Now, Sun Yat-sen was the founder of the Republic of China. He was the founder of the Nationalist Party. So he was an ardent Chinese nationalist. He was one who read, led the revolution that overthrew the Qing dynasty and established uh, the Republic of China in 1911 and 1912. So the idea that they're celebrating his birthday um, at a at an, an event that is under the sponsorship of the Japanese army is at best a little awkward. So this is the second of three crowds that we're going to see today. The first and the biggest is going to be at the racetrack. The second is going to be up here in Jiangwan, just to the north. Um, and the third one we'll get to in just a moment. So from Jiangwan, which is going to be up kind of, see where that medallion is on the top of the map? That's about where Zhang Wan is. So now we're going to go back to the racetrack in the center. And now I want you to head um, 
head west from the racetrack out to that little green dot. Um, and I'm going to move ahead because back at the racetrack, the races have already started. So if you think about throughout the day, Champions Day, the Champions Stakes comes in the afternoon, but you have races already underway earlier in the morning. I'm going to save you some of those people because I think uh, I'm running a little long. So back to the west, you see this woman, Liza Hardoon. So Liza Hardoon is one of the kind of characters that you can never, it seems like you see them all over the place in Shanghai, but not very often in other places. Liza Hardoon is a half French, half Chinese woman. She was raised Chinese, although she didn't learn Mandarin uh, until she was in her 40s. She grew up speaking Shanghainese. Um, and she was married to Silas Hardoon. That's Silas Hardoon, who you see next to her um, with the mustache. Um, Silas Hardoon was one of the wealthiest of Shanghai's Jewish uh, business class. Um, so he was born in Baghdad. He emigrated to Shanghai via um, India and Hong Kong and wound up becoming one of the wealthiest men in Hong Kong. He, uh, sorry, in Shanghai. He dies in 1931 and Liza Hardoon becomes then the wealthiest woman in Asia uh, for the last 10 years of her life. Um, and she dies in October of 1941 and her funeral is, you guessed it, uh, Champions Day, November 12th, 1941. So that's the third crowd that you see going on um, in November of 1941. Um, you see about 2,000 or 3,000 people are gathered at, Ch at Sun Yat-sen's birthday. You've got about five to 10,000 people um, at, the, at the funeral of Liza Hardoon. It's an event that's covered around the world. Newspapers in New York and Los Angeles, Chicago, all have coverage of Liza Hardoon's funeral. And it's a combination. Uh, Silas Hardoon was Jewish. The couple adopted about uh, a dozen uh, children which were raised, depending on whether they were Chinese or Asian, they were raised either Buddhist or Jewish. Uh, and the Hardoon family continues to be um, a really influential family in, in certain circles today. So back to the racetrack again. And then we're gonna go, let me go back to the map. Then just south of the racetrack, so if you go down below it, now we're gonna go over to one other thing. So by this time, it's now about three o'clock in the afternoon and three o'clock in the afternoon was the first showing of uh, Murder Over New York. So Murder Over New York was the latest Charlie Chan movie. Um, and Charlie Chan is, is a figure in Shanghai that's really complicated. Um, so this is a scene from Murder Over New York. So first of all, you can see that um, this is Sidney Toller uh, who's playing uh, Charlie Chan. He's not Chinese, he's in yellow face, right? And so, especially in today's world, when we talk, when issues of race are so front of mind and so important to, to be cognizant of, um, the idea that, Charlie Chan is playing this in yellow face is, is appalling, and it is appalling in many ways. Charlie Chan's complicated, because um, on the one hand, um, he's always the smartest person in the room. He's the one who solves the murder. He's the one who figures it out before everybody else can. On the other hand, he's sort of patronized. Um, everybody calls him Charlie, even though he addresses everybody else as inspector this or sergeant that. Um, and what I say in the book is I think, uh, in some ways, Charlie Chan is a figure who represents Shanghai. Um, so he represents Shanghai because um, it is trying to take a lot of the, the stereotypes and the energy of what's going on in China, but it's all ultimately subject to Western rules. And that's how Charlie Chan, Chan operates. This is a good scene of what's going on that afternoon. So if you wanted to go to the movies, these were your choices. Um, this is only part of the part of the scene, but I like this page from the, this is from the North China Daily News. Uh, you can see not only do you have the, the Hollywood movies around, but you can see the Bolero nightclub. Um, which is going to be a place for people to go, and then Champions Day, right, advertised right there on the top. So back to the racetrack. And now I want to bring to a couple of people who are there together. So this is Ying Tang. Um, Ying Tang is one of the is one of the the people who would have been at the racetrack, and she would have been probably the most popular. She was considered to be the top of Shanghai's social scene. Uh, for for quite a long time, and she played on Broadway, or sorry, she played in Shanghai um, in a play called Lady Precious Stream. And this was so this was a phenomenon around the world, so so popular around the world that it not only did it play in London, but it was also uh, going to be played in Broadway. And Ying Tang was invited to come and play the lead role on Broadway. That fell apart for reasons that are not entirely clear. But she winds up staying in Shanghai throughout the war. And then she's in the audience while people are watching Champions Day. So this is a scene. This might be from the actual race itself. I don't know. I know it's from 1941, but I don't know the exact race that it is. And this is another scene of the, of the Shanghai races. And I like to give a sense of just the, the mixing that you see going on here. So the, the idea that Shanghai is a colonial place or a semi-colonial place, 
is certainly controlled by foreigners and racism is endemic in Shanghai. There's no getting around that. At the same time, there's something going on in the city um, that is that is more than that. So Shanghai is an engine. It's an engine that's fueled by people from around the world. Um, and that includes people who are coming not only from uh, Britain and America and Germany and India, um, but it also includes especially people from all over China. So if you look at that scene, and this is a scene of the of the crowd watching Champions Day, um, and don't read the caption if you don't want to be spoiled as to who wins. Um, but you can see, I love this picture partly because you have the Sikh, uh, the turban Sikh in the foreground, um, probably came as part of the British police force. Um, and But you can also see many of the faces in the crowd are Chinese, many of the faces in the crowd um, are white. Uh, and you'll see a mix of, of men and women, mostly men, but you see a mix of men and women. Um, and then the other picture, not the newspaper photograph, but that's the owner's box. So that's gonna be some of the people who own the horses who are waiting to see what's going to become of them. And this is another scene also on Champions Day. So again, just a, a good sense of the of the crowd. I sometimes like just scanning these photos and looking into uh, looking into seeing what's there. And there's the start and the finish of the race. It, this one doesn't tell you who's in front, but it does tell you that somebody wins. It's not spoiling. OK, this is where I'd like to go out. Uh, and I think this is a good uh, moment. So. Champions Day is November 12th, 1941. There's three more weeks before Pearl Harbor. Uh, and in the question and answer, we might get to find out what happens during World War II to all the people who, would, who had been part of the races. But when I said that, that I'd hope to be launching this book in Shanghai, if I were launching it in Shanghai, this is one of the places that we would be. That's Henchman's Desk. Um, so if you've, if you've seen the book, or if you've seen the start of the book, you know that it starts with Arthur Henchman walking to the races uh, on the morning of Champions Day. And throughout the book, he spends a lot of time writing things at his desk. He writes back to his superiors in Hong Kong or in London, telling them what's going on in Shanghai and describing the bombing, describing um, the refugee crisis, describing inflation and all the other issues that are confronting the city at the time. That's his desk. So that's his desk from HSBC. It's now in the museum that I mentioned before. Um, so I just love the fact that his desk is sitting there. And I had no idea it was there. I was I was there with a with a congressional staff delegation. Uh, part of this, uh, an introduction to China tour that I was uh, escorting. And we walked around the corner for this room and there was a henchman's desk. And I thought they thought I was a bit odd for saying, it's henchman's desk, don't you know that? Um, none of them did, but there we are. And this is just a nice view of the architecture of, this is the inside of now the old Shanghai Race Club. And you can see, um, you can't quite make out what the detail is, but those are horse heads in the, in the railing, sort of a wrought iron railing. And that's what uh, the the uh, racetrack museum looks like. This is a diorama inside. And then I think we have just Shanghai and a, a day not unlike today, a little colder than this, but kind of gray. At least I don't know what it's like. I'm in New Jersey. I don't know what it's like there in Westport, but it, uh, it's kind of a gray and gloomy day with clouds coming in and out. And there we are. So I'm going to leave it at that. Um, I believe in, in people who make time to come, I believe that they should get a chance to ask questions. So um, this leaves us about half of our time. Um, and so, yeah, and, and I, um, so thank you so much, James, for that. Uh, incredibly interesting. And uh, just before we kind of jump in, I'm, I'm playing the, the part of Alex, the disembodied head right now uh, to ask the questions and I'll facilitate any questions that you guys have for, for James. So either ask in the comments or in the ask a question feature below. Uh, but just before we jump into the questions, I got to say it, you handled those tech glitches better than pretty much any author we've ever had. So Thank you for staying cool and, and, and calm during that part of this. Um, <laughs> uh, well, after I, I think students would say, you know, this is part of being an instructor in uh, in 21st century America is, is how the tech goes wrong and how, how well you handle it. It has a lot to do with what your teaching evaluations are like. So I'm motivated. It's not if the tech goes wrong, it's when and how bad will it be, right? Um, so I just I would love to start a little bit uh, more general and then dive down into some specifics. So just first, where does your your interest in China begin? Is it a lifelong interest and fascination, or I know you visited in the early '90s? Does it start there, or, or could you just talk about that? Yeah, sure. Um, uh, so I, you know, so I left Staples, right? Staples, 1987. Actually, I think you mentioned Jeff Pigay's, um I'm pretty sure that he graduated with me in 1987 um, for your next program. Um, so I went on from Staples to um, the University of Richmond in Virginia. And there I kind of got interested in, I mean, I was interested in studying history already, but I became interested in, in studying China. And I was particularly uh, wanted to work with Jonathan Spence, who's an historian at Yale, now retired. Um, but that's who I wanted to, to study with. And it was really just his vision of history 
that attracted me to the subject. And he did China, so that's what I wanted to do. And so I was, you know, I was lucky enough to get to get into Yale and to work with him. And uh, that was kind of the die was cast. And the thing I remember, and I think my parent, well, at least one of my parents, I'm sure they're both there in the audience, um, that, you know, they'll remember. So I went off to China in the summer of 1992 for the first time. Um, I'd already been in my graduate program for a year. And I remember pretty clearly uh, that moment of, as it was a Northwest Airlines 747 kind of breaking through the clouds. And as I saw the fields and, and the, the, you know, the rivers and the cities and the roads of China coming into view, you know, this moment of panic flashed through my head, which is, what if I hate it? You know, I've invested all this time and all this money and all this energy. It's like, what if, what if I hate this? But, uh, but I didn't. And I wound up doing, uh, I was doing a program up in a city called Harbin, uh, which some of, uh, some of the attendants may recognize. Um, so Harbin is up near the Russian border, and it still has a, a long shadow of, of its Russian legacy uh, cast over it. And that really attracted my attention because I was fascinated by this connection between the West and with China. And that really became my career. Um, that wasn't the intent when I started, but really the interaction between China and the West and between especially Chinese and Westerners. So there are people who do diplomatic history and they're looking at how states and armies and diplomats interact with one another. That's not what I'm primarily doing. I'm primarily looking at individuals and how how they interact with one another and how cultures connect to one another on a on a one on one basis. So I have, I have one more general question. I see we have questions now from the audience, so I'll jump in there. But first, just I I, I think it's such a, a really such a great narrative hook to uh, to focus on the one day November twelfth and these three events. Can you talk about maybe when in your research, like at what point did you come to the conclusion that you were going to do that? So, uh, well, that's a great question because it has a funny answer. So um, I had been looking around for a story, um, or for, for a story of how I think of it, for a, for a topic uh, to write about. And I'd written about uh, Chinese nationalism in Harbin. I'd written about a Buddhist monk uh, in my second book. And I was looking for something that was going to give me a way to, to talk about the interaction between Chinese and foreigners. And Shanghai is a natural place to do that, right? Um, Shanghai is also, also uh, and this is a historian, technical historian word, awesome, right? I mean, so Shang, I'm very sad that I'm not able to go to Shanghai right now because it's such a great such a great city. The energy there is really, is really fantastic. Um, and so walking around Shanghai, I discovered that the racetrack was there. And I like this just as an idea of a narrative hook of doing the one day. So I just kind of decided that that's what I would do. And I started fishing around for a day um, because you can, you can find significant things going on just about any day. It's a question of how you tell the story and, and not that all days are the same, um, but you can find a day and you can, you can see what it has to offer you. So I was reading a book, uh, it's called Shang, uh, China Races, and it's about the history of horse racing in, Shang, in China. And it mentioned the last champion stakes, which were run in May, I think it was May the 7th of 1941. So I went to Shanghai, started working in this old Jesuit library, uh, which is on the outskirts of the city, and started doing that research. And I spent about, I don't know, a week, not quite a week, focusing on this day in early May. And then I got to the end. I said, "Oh, I'm going to look in. No I'm going to look in November when the next champions would have been. It was run twice every year at the for the spring and the fall seasons. I'm going to go to the fall. I'm going to see. Well, what did they say? Uh, the first time the champion stakes hasn't happened. And lo and behold, the champion stakes did happen. So the book was wrong, which is something really that's an important thing for for historians to remember is that your sources can be wrong. Um, so then I wound up looking at November 12th, and November 12th is a way better day. Um, so first of all, you have Liza Hardoon's funeral." which is an international spectacle that's the, the likes of which would, I mean, you could write a whole book on that, um, maybe some foreshadowing there. Um, and the fact that Sun Yat-sen's birthday is also a big deal because it enables you to bring in not just the broader political history of China, but also um, the, the question of nationalism and the direct connection to the Japanese. So that's really interesting. Um, so that was kind of how it all got started. And then the fact that the movie was opening and uh, there's a couple other things going on on November 12th as well, but those things all fit together. So that was, it was looking very consciously for a narrative hook, but Shanghai offers so many narrative hooks. I was lucky because I had lots of choices. Yes, and this is a, a question that I'm going to combine with uh, Jolie's question. Um, so it, having those other events happen on, it, it was Champions Day something that would take over the whole city? I mean, is that kind of it, uh, just a huge citywide event? And isn't it weird that they would have a movie premiere and a, a funeral of a very famous person on the same day? I mean, you can't, I don't know. So, sure. Um, hi, Jolie. Thanks for coming. I can't see you, but I know you're there. Um, I know I appreciate it. It's really touching that to have uh, old friends come and, and uh, take time out to come to come listen to me, listen to me talk. Um, 
So yeah, Champions Day was a holiday. Um, yeah. It was a holiday throughout the international settlement. So on, there'd be twice a year. So most of the businesses were closed. Um, most of the people at the races were Chinese. Now, even in the international settlement, which I described as this, as this colony, semi-colony, um, still most of the people, and by most I mean about 95% at least, were Chinese. So the overwhelmingly part, overwhelming portion of the city was Chinese, but also the people at the races were Chinese. Now the race club itself excluded restricted membership to whites only, um, and that's an issue that we can get into. Um, but there were lots of Chinese who were there, and including in the members' enclosure because they had ways of getting around the the restrictions. So th why would they have had all these other things going on the same day? Well, I mean, it, in the same way that you know Super Bowl Sunday is sort of an unofficial holiday here, but you still have other stuff going on. It kind of worked that way. Um, it just happened to be a Wednesday, and that's when movies opened. So movies opened on Wednesday. A, a Charlie Chan movie would have been significant because Charlie Chan was popular in, in Shanghai, um, but it wouldn't have been like a star-studded premiere of anything uh, going on like that. Um, the actor who played Charlie Chan came to China, came to Shanghai the year before, and in a really uncomfortable kind of way, he stayed in character for his entire visit which was really, really strange. Because remember, he's not Chinese. So that was super weird. Um, but the Charlie Chan movie's going on. And um, Liza Hardoon's funeral, That's there's a lot of, of, of cloak and dagger going on. So there's, there's a controversy about her death because, so her husband is Jewish, right? But there was, and supposedly she converted to Judaism and she inherited all of his fortune. But there's a lot of other branches of the family who contest the will saying that she wasn't actually Jewish. Um, and so... Of course, in, in Jewish practice, you need to bury somebody right away. Um, Liza Hardoon wasn't buried for about a month after she died. So it clearly wasn't a, a Jewish funeral. Um, but there's a whole bunch of contradiction. There were there was theft involved, a will was stolen, and another will appeared magically, and all these things sort of went on. Um, so I think that her her funeral was just sort of disconnected from what was going on at the racetrack. And it just happened to be Sun Yat Sen's birthday that was you know, no, it was just coincidence. Occasionally it would be on Champions Day, occasionally occasionally not. So I was just lucky that that day showed up. So again, it was originally, kind of going back to some of your earlier question, Alex, um, originally the whole book was going to be one day. It was going to start at dawn and it was going to end at sundown or midnight or whenever I took it to. Um, that wound up not quite working because I need to get more of the background in for people to make sense of it. But for that last section of the book, which really does go through kind of hour by hour what happens on November 12th, 1941, I was just very fortunate um, to find a day when you've got all these different spectacles taking place at the same time. That's interesting. Um, and now let me get to Jolie's question. Uh, so she asks, how and when did you become passionate about Champions Day and what made you want to write this book? I think you've touched on it a little bit, but maybe to dive deeper. Yeah, I mean, I think I would say just that. I mean, uh, we talked not too long ago about our, our uh, you know, mutual friend, Jeremy Schapp. Um, so he obviously made, made good on his desire to be a sports writer. I was saying I was always had like a frustrated part of me that wanted to be a sports writer. Um, so that's the fact that I could find a story that not only enabled me to, to, to do my history thing, um, you know, to, to practice the, the craft that I'd been trained to do, um, but the fact that I could do it around a, a horse race was pretty much, was pretty much fun. Um, and as I got more and more into it, I mean, if you go to Shanghai and you can find a lot of this online. And so I've been very fortunate now that I can teach my students in my classes at St. Joe's. Very few of them have Chinese to do research, but they, their English is good. And so I've got a bunch of these English language newspapers that are from Shanghai. Um, most of them you can get digitally. Um, but a lot, some of them you have to go to Shanghai to get, uh, or to or the few other places that you can get them. But as you just get immersed in the, in the stories of the day and just reading the newspaper and finding out, you know, this rivalry, as the book tries to detail, the rivalry between Aitkenhead stables and henchman stables with Cornell Franklin sort of kind of poking his head in every now and again, um, it really dominated the the, the settlement uh, in a way that was it, it kind of bizarre. I mean, it was, it, I mean, we talk about Nero fiddling while Rome burns, you know, as kind of a cliche. It was almost literally what was going on um, in Shanghai. So they were all these people gathered to watch the horse races and the crowds at the racetrack got bigger and bigger during the war, um, in part because people had less to do, maybe something we can relate to now. Um, so you're stuck in the international settlement. You couldn't go on vacation. You couldn't go up to the, to the Yangtze River gorges. You couldn't go to, go to uh, you know, Hong Kong or to Qingdao very easily. You couldn't go into the countryside to do the things that people used to do. They were stuck there at the races. Um, and I think they also turned to them more because they wanted distraction because it was, I mean, people knew, people weren't dumb. They, they were aware that this was all going to come crashing down. The way I sometimes talk about it 
is it's as if Shanghai were Wiley e. Coyote and they had stepped off the edge of the cliff, um, but they were suspended in midair because they hadn't looked down and realized that there was nothing underneath them anymore. Um, and that was kind of what I think of those folks at, at Champions Day is that they are Wiley e. Coyote over the edge of the cliff surrounded by a cloud and that cloud is gonna dissipate in about three weeks and down they're gonna go. Um. I'm going to go to Bob's question. Uh, he asked, what was the level of terror among the people at the races? The level of terror. Um, so um, I'm wondering if that's my uncle, Bob. Um, so Bob, in terms of the level of terror, I would say when they're at the races, they didn't have a lot of terror at all. Um, I think they were pretty well distracted. Now, when they left the racetrack, um, that's a you know different question. I think one of the things that I see go on as, okay, as time as time passes. Um, so in this, in the summer of 1937, you have something called Bloody Saturday. And that's when you have a, a bomb that's dropped uh, in Shanghai, right out, there are two of them, one right outside the, uh, the Cathay Hotel, which is the Sassoon's Hotel, and one uh, near the racetrack. And maybe a thousand people are killed um, by those bombs. But those are the only two really violent issue uh, events that take place inside the international settlement. So in terms of terror, I think that in 1937 into 1938, people are terrified because they expect that the Japanese armies are going to come marching in at any moment. Um, and they're really prepared for the end. And people start leaving and, and every uh, embassy and consulate in Shanghai is recommending to their citizens that they get out. Um, and so in 1937-38, I think they're pretty terrified. 1939, I think they may get more terrified again because that's when the war breaks out in Europe and now the, the Brits and the Germans and the French are starting to look at things a little bit differently. But by the time in 19, you know, 1939 comes to an end and 1940 comes to an end and now you're into 1941 and this thing is still going on. So I think, you know, my impression of reading these people's accounts and their diaries is that um, on the one hand, they know this can't last. On the other hand, eh, maybe it could. So I'm not sure they're terrified. I think they may be, I think denial might be a better word than, uh, than terror for most of them. Um, and Susan Carter asks, how does racing in Shanghai today compare to that in 1941 uh, in terms of the culture of the city? Well, of course, there's no racing in Shanghai today. Um, so there is the racetrack, the building at the racetrack is there. And now the track has been turned into a park. So um, the story of the racetrack coming down is something that happens. So after 1945, um, the nationalists come back in, they take control, but the racetrack has been shut down. Um, this is part of the, the story that gets, gets very, very murky. Um, but the races continue all through the war. The last race that I found record of was in a Chinese newspaper. They were advertising the races uh, the first week of August 1945. So just a week or so before, um, before the, uh, the dropping of the bombs on, on Japan. But the racetrack closes. It's an emblem of imperialism. Uh, China has reclaimed sovereignty over all these areas. So the, so the races don't resume in Shanghai after 1945, although Cornell Franklin goes back and tries to tries to negotiate with the uh, tries to negotiate with the with the Chinese government to try and reopen the track, but it fails. The place that racing continues in China um, is in Hong Kong, and I'm going to guess that some of the people in the audience have been to the races in Hong Kong. And if uh, you get a chance to go, I recommend it highly. the The racetrack at Happy Valley in the center of Hong Kong is a is a spectacle that really has to be experienced. So it's it's this you know, dark green turf track in the center of a valley called Happy Valley. And so it's surrounded on all sides by tropical mountains. And then you've got this vertical landscape, uh, vertical landscape, but also a vertical cityscape all around it. And it's this really this jewel that's, that's right there. Um, a lot of people from Shanghai go to Hong Kong. And that's what makes Hong Kong that we know today, or I should say maybe the Hong Kong that we knew at least until a couple of years ago. Um, but what made Hong Kong in the 20th century uh, was the exodus of people going from Shanghai to Hong Kong who were fleeing um, the communist government there. And so you have this mixture of kind of a, a British colonial government and an energy that was coming from the population, mainly from, from China, mainly from, from Shanghai. Um, and so the the racing culture that continued in Hong Kong, it, that's the closest I think you could come to 1940s Shanghai would be in um, would be in Hong Kong and Happy Valley, and a lot of the same people were there. Just on, I guess, on that subject, the maybe talk a little bit about, uh, about the cultural backdrop of Shanghai in, in the early 40s, because 
especially in the, the the footage that you showed, it was very striking how international Shanghai appeared. But um, it's true that the Shanghai Race Club excluded Chinese members, correct? Yeah, yeah. It's um, you know that's probably the most difficult part to to make sense of and to sort of fully understand. So I think that if we look at there, there's kind of two extremes. One extreme of Shanghai, looking back at we call the golden age of Shanghai, and I've I've done a couple of uh, of, of podcasts and radio interviews lately where we've talked about this, and so I've I've spent some time going back and forth on this subject. If you look at Shanghai's golden age, as kind of the 1920s through the into the 19 up to like 1930s, right, right when the Japanese invade, um, that's very tempting. It's very stylish. It's very aesthetically pleasing. Um, it's got music. It's got music from all over the world. In fact, one of the ironies is that you have African American musicians who couldn't play in the United States in the 19 teens and 20s. Um, they would go and play in Shanghai. Um, where you could play with an integrated uh, crowd, an integrated uh, band. Um, so you had some all, all sorts of things that just com are completely bizarre. You wouldn't expect to see them in Shanghai. Um, so it is an, an, er an energy there that I really admire. And I think in today's world, when a lot of our politics and a lot of our, our thinking tends to be turning inward, I think this time and place where you see something that's so cosmopolitan, and international, I just find the energy that there is something that I'd, I'd like to hold on to. So that's one extreme, is looking at that as being like a really positive and uh, a, a stylish place with a, with a lot of economic and cultural and um, all sorts of other energies. The other extreme is it's colonial, it's racist. 95% um, of the population might have been Chinese, and there were wealthy Chinese in Shanghai, to be sure, but there are many more who were not wealthy and many who are poor. I mean, there's not, it's not coincidence that the Communist Party of China is founded in Shanghai. Um, it's founded not very far from the racetrack. Um, and that's, again, owing to it's the, it's the city in China with the biggest industrial base. It's a city in China that has a lot of, of the have-nots as well as a lot of the haves. It's, a, it's definitely a, a place of extremes. So I think if you look at it in that way, okay, Shanghai is colonial and it's imperialist and it's racist. So that's something that we want to, we want to move away from. And what I try to do at the end of the book is try in some way to, to, to kind of talk about, well, how can we, can we try to find a way that we can, we can learn from the past uh, and not simply reject it, not make the same mistakes over again, but maybe um, do something better the next time around. And so, so for instance, you asked about the race club. So the race club itself was whites only, right? In terms of membership, but as you saw from those pictures, a lot of the people in the in the crowds were Chinese. That it wasn't simply that people um, they would take money from the Chinese who wanted to come see. There were Chinese horse owners there too, because you remember those two tracks, the two Chinese tracks that were up in the northern part of the city. Um, those horse owners, who were almost all Chinese, they had they were given reciprocal membership at the race club, so they could their ponies were in the stables. We haven't talked about. The China ponies at all. Um, they were in the. They could have their ponies in the stables. They could be part of the members, um, the members enclosure. They could be there and do all these things that they weren't technically members. Um, so that's uh, again, you, it's it's a contradiction without without question. It's a contradiction. It is China's most cosmopolitan international place, um, and it's also a place of of you know racism and colonialism. And and there's no getting around the fact that both of those things are there. And if you try to have it. If you try to make it just one or the other, you're going to miss a big part of the story. I think uh, Susan Leibel's question is, is quite prescient because she asked it earlier and it touches on just, just what you talked about. Uh, but just before this, so were there, um, were the jockeys Chinese or, or was it a mix of different people? It's a mix. This is the first time the jockey question has come up. So I didn't mention the jockeys when I, when I did my excerpt that I, I named some of them. So they were from all over the place. Um, so one of the people uh, who was riding the winner, and I won't say who it is, his name is Alex Stryker, but his name was really Alexei Stryevsky. Um, he was Russian. In fact, his father had been a Russian army officer that had, had been uh, uh, kicked out of the army in disgrace. Um, Charlie Encarnasau was riding the other, and uh, you may recognize that name as Portuguese. Um, the Portuguese, many of them were Macanese. So Macau, which is the other colony next to Hong Kong, had been a Portuguese colony. So there's a long, long history of Portuguese uh, in China. So um, you have a number of Portuguese jockeys, but you also had Indian jockeys, the Newts and double O-D-T. Uh, the Newts were from India and they rode horses, but you also had uh, a fair number of English and other European jockeys. Um, uh, Eric Cumine, who is a Eurasian, he had a Chinese mother and an and a English father. Uh, he was riding when he was there. 
Um, he, in fact, became the greatest racing commentator. Um, he wrote a column in the newspaper called The Chaser, and that was supposedly because he was always on the worst horses. And so he was in, he was chasing the field. But he said that that gave him a unique perspective because he knew what all the strategy was and what all the other riders were doing. And so he wrote, he, he became an odds maker. Um, Gabor Renner was Hungarian. Um, you had other Russians, you, I mean, people from all over. And a good number were Chinese. Um, and so then when the race track is taken over by the Japanese after the invasion, um, eventually all of the allied nationals get put in internment camps. So if you've seen Empire of the Sun, the Steven Spielberg movie, you have, uh, you have the camps that all the British and Americans get put into, but the races continue largely with either Chinese um, or with Japanese or with some of these um, other nations. So for instance, Portugal is neutral, so they're, they're, uh, they can still ride. Um, and you have Austrians and Germans, they can still ride because they're allied with the Japanese. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, the, the jockey, the jockey club is very, is very international there. Oh, very interesting. I, and I want to, because I did jump on Susan's question, I want to circle back to it. So she asked, what, what is the role of Shanghai today? Uh, do you think that today Shanghai is trending towards cosmopolitanism? And can Shanghai influence China's outlook on the rest of the world? So Shanghai, I've, I've now kind of cast my lot with Shanghai um, and I'm spending a lot of time um, writing and thinking about it and I wish visiting and maybe I will again before too long. Um, Shanghai has, has got an interesting relationship to the rest of the People's Republic. So after 1949, Shanghai was in a lot of ways punished for uh, its Western past. So while you had, uh, so if you think about China in the first few decades after, after the PRC is founded, um, it's going through a whole bunch, right? It goes through the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution and the Korean War. And when China emerges in 1979, when you have this reform and opening period, which has led to this economic growth of the past several decades, you would you might expect that Shanghai would be at the forefront of that. Um, but it wasn't because, and they, people talk about this in different ways, but it was quite explicitly excluded. Um, and so for that first decade, you have money going into all different parts of the country, but not going into Shanghai because Shanghai was kind of just left as it was. And it's not until after 1989, so after the Tiananmen Square massacre, Deng Xiaoping has to find a way to jumpstart his reform so that the hardliners in China don't start to pull it back uh, toward um, toward away, away from reform, pull it back away from reform. So then he relies on Shanghai and that's when Shanghai explodes. So if you look at the images of Shanghai, I don't have any, I could call some up, but I don't want to risk the wrath of the tech gods. Um, but if you look at the skyline of Shanghai, I mean, you'll recognize it. It's almost the logo for 21st century China, right? You've got three of the 10 tallest buildings in the world, all within a couple of blocks of one another. Um, none of that existed prior to 1992. It's all been built in those last, um, in the last few decades. So definitely this outlook of Shanghai as, uh, as something cosmopolitan and international is something that is kind of pulling China forward or pulling China outward. I'll say outward, not forward. Um, at the same time, you know, China's an authoritarian country and it's become more authoritarian in the past under, under Xi Jinping without question. And so people asked, have asked me if I think, you know, does Shanghai have the opportunity to take over from Hong Kong as kind of the center for international finance and business? And my answer was always no, because Shanghai is, as, as part of the PRC, like directly governed part of the PRC, it doesn't have rule of law and it doesn't have transparent institutions that would enable it to be really an attractive business place. I mean, obviously a ton of business goes on in Shanghai, but for international, uh, international investment, if you have a choice between Hong Kong and Shanghai, you're always going to choose Hong Kong. Now that's kind of changed a bit, not because Shanghai has gotten better, but because Hong Kong has gotten worse. Um, and for those of you who love Hong Kong, and I'm certainly one of them, um, it's very sad to see what's being what's going on there right now. Um, and so Hong Kong, I think, is losing some of that uh, rule of law and some of that transparency, and that's something that that worries me. So I hope that the Shanghai model for looking outward and and cosmopolitanism and internationalism is going to carry the day. And I do think things will get better, but they may get worse before they do. Um, and, and actually, I'd, I'd love to shift to to a couple of process questions, if that's okay. Um, and I think Anthony has a good lead off one. Um, he asks, what research surprised you the most uh, while you were researching the book? Well, the most kind of the simplest and the most mundane one was that I, you know, I spent a week looking at the wrong day. Um, mm -hmm. So that, that caused me to have to shift it. Okay, so what aspect of my research surprised me the most? 
<clears throat> I guess I would say it's a disappointment um, more than surprise. So when I so when I first started working in China, which was in the mid '90s, early mid '90s, in Harbin, the archives were basically uh, shut off. You know, I, I mean, there's there's kind of sad stories about uh, you know having holding a catalog in my hand for the archives and being told, "I'm sorry, you can't see anything here." Um, and so going down to Shanghai was something that was really really exciting because um, after having spent six months and you know with lots of banquets and lots of you know trading cigarettes and lots of connections being made by teachers and their teachers and their students. And six months of all that, I got basically nothing. And you came to Shanghai and you could walk, you could get off a plane, you could take a cab to the center of the city, you could walk into the archives, hand them your passport, and within five minutes be looking at documents. That was something really great. That all came crashing to an end while I was doing this book. So that was, the, I think the part that surprised me is I expected to be able to spend more time in the Shanghai City Archives finding these stories. And in the end, um, those archives wound up being being closed down. And um, I mean, they're not completely closed down. In fact, some stretches, some material has become available online. Um, but certainly for the last five years, it's been, um, the surprise has been how challenging it's been to get that information and how that's forced me to go to other places. So some in Hong Kong, some in Britain, um, some in New York and Washington, D.C., but, but just having to having to kind of do workarounds for stuff that I thought might be easier. Um, so how, how long did it take you to write the book? So when the book came out, I was, you know, going back and, and being kind of sentimental about looking through the process. Um, I remember in uh, so I found an email and it was from, I want to say, 2013, might have been 2012. But that was the day I went into the archives. So this li is a library. So there's an old Jesuit library on the outskirts of Shanghai, which is now a branch of the Shanghai Municipal Library. It's the same building. It's a lot of the same collection, but it had been founded by the Jesuits. Um, and so that's where I went, because that's the place to go when you want to find out about foreign Shanghai. And so I went there, um, and that was in the summer, I think of 2013. I want to say 2013, but it was either 12 or 13. And that was the day I remember thinking to myself, I'm walking out into the very humid, very muggy Shanghai summer and thinking to myself, there's a, I can do a book here. Like, I don't know how good it'll be and I don't know how it's going to turn out, but there's a book here. Um, so if you count it that way, um, you know, I turned in the last draft of this a couple of months ago into my editor. So that's like seven years, something like that. Um, and just because we are uh, running out of time, I, just a couple of questions that I always, I'm just obsessed with. Uh, can I ask what your writing habits are, just kind of day to day writing habits? Um, I am. People who know me are going to be laughing. So I, you know, I'm easily distracted. Um, my writing habits are going to be. I tend to, I tend to write in a very kind of frenetic kind of way. Um, so I'll, you know, some people write for like an hour on, an hour off, an hour on, or, or like a day, day on, a day off. I tend to write something like three minutes on and three minutes off. Um, and that's not necessarily good, but it's, uh, but it's, it's kind of what I do. I will. I also tend to be. I tend to write as I research, which is not always good because it, it, it winds up getting the narrative kind of balled up and it, it can be challenging to get it back. I'll put in a, a plug for Scrivener. So if anybody's writing something that's bigger than uh, bigger than a few pages, Scrivener is a great app for, for writing. It's, uh, it's really helpful for writing a big, a big piece and you can move parts of it around. That was one of my questions. If you, if you use some kind of software to kind of keep track of notes, and, and I know Scrivener is a very detailed program. Yeah, Scrivener is great for writing. I, I recommend it highly. And Susan Liebel, who's on here too, she she pointed me that way. So she gets credit for many things, but that's one of them. Um, so one of the questions that I ask every writer when they, when they come in, because it really does fascinate me, what does a bad day at the writing desk look like for you? Or feel like? <laughs> well, the easy answer is to say a bad day is when you, you know, you have, you start out with no more words than you, you end up with no more words than you started out with. Um, I think a bad day at the at the writer's desk is when you just kind of write you write something and you wind up finding it to be not very good. Like cuz I'll often as I you write something and then you'll go back and read other parts. So, you know, I'll get to the end of something and I've uh, this chapter this chapter is really nice. I'm going to do it. Uh, and then I go back and I read from the beginning and I read it and it's like this is this is terrible. Like th that's a bad day. Um, and those are, I mean, they're part of the process. You, things have to be terrible before they become good. That's kind of how, that's kind of, kind of a theme. <laughs> um, and are you working on something now and, and how have you found working and writing through the pandemic? 
Um, working, I mean, it's a, for people who are really, are really writers, you know, I think that living in the pandemic hasn't changed too much because they're kind of a solitary group. You know, I, you know, I've, I'm, I'm a parent and I've also a, a professor. And so for both of those things, like trying to figure out how to make, do online classes and, and then also try to like have a, an 11 year old who's trying to go through online fifth grade. Um, so those are the kinds of things that there's actually been a lot. The, the time has been, I wouldn't say it's more or less necessarily, but it's been very differently managed. Gotcha. And, and then just finally, as we wrap up, where can folks find you online? So the best place to find me um, is you can go to my website, which is J James Carter. So J A Y, which um, is what you call me. And then James, which is the name you see on the screen and then Carter. So just one word, J James Um That's where everything is there. Or if you want to send me an email, um, the place to do it is you can, the easiest thing to say is just to send it to either uh, send it to my my St. Joe's email. It's easier to remember, which is just J Carter, J-C-A-R-T-E-R at S-J-U dot E-D-U. But if you go to my website, you can always find how to how to reach me. Okay, and I'm going to try to muscle my way on screen with you to thank there you. There you are. Uh, oh, nope, you're gone. Well, what I'll do is that and say, J thank you I, to thank you in person. Thank you so much for doing this. This was such a great talk. Um, and please, everybody, uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, we appreciate it. We always appreciate the support. Uh, please do grab your signed book-plated copy of Champions Day by clicking the uh, the green button there. Um, and the cool thing about Crowdcast is that right after this finishes, uh, you'll be able to watch the replay at this link, and you can share the link uh, with your friends, and, and we do encourage you to do that. So once again, James, thank you so much. Congrats on the book. And uh, when we reopen and have people in person, I want you to be one of our people in person. Um, I would I would love that. And thank you, everybody, for coming and for the great questions. All right. Good night, everybody.